place. Today we want to talk about the power of sickness and death. It's a subject that uh, is not always approached. Uh, I picked this subject out and last Sunday. Uh, Barry said, what do you want me to put on the sign out front? I said, put the power of sickness and death. I had little understanding that in our church family there would be three deaths this week. Uh, and uh, for this church, I have never experienced in 30 years three deaths in a, in a week. In fact, rarely do we have one every five months or so. So it, it's been an incredible thing. And as I've been looking at this sermon, I wrote the sermon before the events of this week. But I thought how exacting uh, that we would speak on this particular subject. You know, health is a wonderful thing. But the fact is, we all die, don't we? We do. And it's usually of something. They call it natural causes. But if you die of cancer, that's called a natural cause. If you die of a heart attack, that's called a natural cause. An unnatural cause is if somebody were to be injured in a car accident or something like that. In our day, uh, when you go to a doctor's office and you have a test, and uh, you're having maybe a tumor checked out, and the doctor comes back and he has that long face and he says, it's cancer. What does that immediately do to our thinking? Or if we hear that of a loved one, it immediately and dramatically affects our thinking. But the reality is that if you are healthy, you rarely think about death, at least yours. You're on your top of your game, you're feeling good, you're healthy. And you're not really occupied with the subject of death or sickness. And yet it should be something that we should think about because death will overtake all of us. We would be wise to consider this question. What next? What happens after death? And today we want to look at the power of sickness and death in the life of an unbeliever. It is King Ben-Hadad. He is king of Syria. He's now very sick, and he's rethinking life. And we want to look and see how he lived when all was well, and how he lives and what changes takes place when he is losing his health. In fact, he is very fearful that this is a sickness unto his death. And the goal is to see the necessity to face up to the issue of death and what follows. And we want to do this when we are of sound mind and body so as to be ready and help others to be ready for that inevitable day. It will come to all of us. And so we will look at the two time periods in his life and we'll compare them with our life. When all is well will be the first things we look at, and then when all is not well. When all is well, King Benadad was a warrior king. He was perhaps a very fierce kind of person. In our terminology, we might call him a macho man, not afraid to die, at least in battle. And it's, of course, one thing to die quickly and quite another to have time to think about it. And he is a warrior. When you're out there fighting in battle, you're not thinking about losing, you're thinking about winning. And your perspective is a little different. Now, the king was not without religion. Even unbelievers have religion. By unbelievers, we mean people who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But this king had religion. He worshipped a god. Do you remember when Naaman the leopard was healed? Naaman, of course, was one of his men. And it says in 2 Kings 5.18, in this matter, and, and Naaman goes back to the prophet, thanks him for healing him, and he says, but you know, I serve a king who worships a different god. So he says, in this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant, when my master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, 
leaning on my arms, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon. And when I bow myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. Now, Rimon was a sort of sun god responsible for growing agriculture and making one wealthy or well off. Of course, he was represented by a stature. False gods are always represented by statures. The Lord forbids us to make statures because there is no stature that can represent the living God who created the heavens and the earth. And so it's represented by a stature and they had a temple to Rimon and they would go in and bow before the stature and then they would come out about the day's work. The God that he worshiped was not the true God, but he was not the living God. It was a man-made God, and why did he find comfort in that? I would like to suggest this. Men find comfort, women find comfort in ritual, even if that's all it is, is ritual. And we need to be aware of that. Uh, bowing down before a stature is a ritual. Kneeling, rising, kneeling, is the, it's all rituals, and people have all sorts of ideas about serving God. I remember that a lady came to see our church and said, I can attend church here. I said, is there something wrong with the message? Is there something wrong with what we do? What, what is it that would keep you from attending church here? She said, you don't have a single stained, stained glass window in the building. Not a single one. How can I worship without a stained glass window? Would you call that ritual? You know, the early Christians met in caves. They didn't think about stained glass windows. And then another person attended our church, and he was a well-known Christian man that I knew, and he had just moved to the area and was looking for a church, and I said to him, hey, I'm glad you're here. You think you'll come back? He said, I can't. I said, was well, there something wrong with him? Oh, no, the message was right on. Was there something wrong? That we, well, no, no. You don't understand. Now, in those days, I wasn't wearing a tie. I wear a tie because my wife says I'm handsome in a tie. And so, you know, I, I figured if my wife thinks I'm handsome, I'm going to wear a tie. But I wasn't wearing a tie. I was just sort of laid back. And, and uh, he said, I could never go to a church where the pastor doesn't wear a tie. And I think of all the ridiculous things that we set up as criteria in our lives. And people like ritual. I remember recently talking to someone who was attending a church that really wasn't preaching the gospel, but they said, I'm comfortable there. I know the routine. But worshiping God is not about knowing a routine. And that's important to understand. But this, this pagan worshiper would go in and he would do his thing before the statue, and then he'd go out and go to battle. He certainly didn't want anything to do with the God of Israel. He had his own God, and he had a God created after his own image. And right after Elisha tells Naaman how to be healed, and he gets healed, he goes back to his master, and what does his master do? <laughs> he attacks Israel. No change in his heart or direction at all. He just saw his major general get healed of leprosy. You would think he would say, wow, what a miracle took place. Instead, he says, you know what? I think I want the gold and silver in the land of Israel. And he attacks them. See, he has his health, and he has his wealth. He's not worried about truth. He's on top of the world, and he's going to do what he wants to do. Now let's look at another event in his life brought, that brought him into an encounter with the power of God. Some years earlier, Ben Hadad attacks Israel, and he is sure that his army is going to have victory. And sometimes when you're younger and stronger, you're a little cocky. I don't know if you experienced that in your life, but between 18 and 30, you can take the world on. And, and He's, he's a little bit like that. And, and what does he do? He's, in, he's getting ready for battle, but he's so sure he's going to win. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 16, they went out at noon, and when Ben Hayden was drinking himself drunk in the booths, he and the 32 kings who were with him. Hey, 
They're having a party before they go to war. They're so sure of victory that they're drinking themselves drunk. But God gives Israel the victory. Even with the 32 kings fighting with him and his own mighty army, God steps in and gives Israel the victory. He's told by his men <clears throat> that the reason God, the Israelites were able to win the battle was they were fighting in the hills. And the Israelite God is the God of the hills. See, in the pagan worship, you have a God for this and a God for that and a God for this. Our God, of course, created the heavens and the earth and all that it contains. But so now he says, oh, I get it. We were fighting on the wrong terrain. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 23, and the servants of the king of Syria said to him, their gods are the gods of the hills. And so they are stronger than we, well, because you see, our God is not a God of the hills. So we have to get this battle somewhere else. Let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. If they don't fight on the hills, they can't win because they worship the God of the hills. And so if we go to the plains, they're out of luck. We're going to win. So they gather their men again, only to be soundly defeated. Because God's a little upset with that point of view. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 28, and a man of God came near and said to the king of Israel, Thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not of God of the valleys. In other words, they've made God smaller than he is. He's not of God of the valleys. Therefore, I will give all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so he says, that, you know what? The Syrians are saying your God is a small God, but your God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Watch what I'm going to do to the Syrians, and you'll know that God's in control. But not only did the Israelites know that God was in control, but now Ben-Hadad knows that God is in control. He's going to get the same message. He's going to be beaten, even in the valley. And so a great slaughter takes place, and Ben-Hadad uh, sues for peace. He's now running from the Israelites. And, and now he's not feeling so strong. So he, he sues for peace to see if the Israelites will end the battle and it'll all end up where he'll be able to live. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 32. So they, he sends men to the Israelites. So they tied sackcloth around their waist and put ropes on their heads and went to the king of Israel and said, Your servant, Ben-Hadad, says, Please let me live. And he said, does he still live? He is my brother. And then when Ben-Hadad ben -Hadad said to him, the cities that my father took from your father I will restore, and you may establish bazaars. I'm, he's out to conquer Israel. Now he's making concession for his life. And that's what we do. We make concessions for our life. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to return everything. And Ahab said, I will let you go on these terms. And so they make a covenant. Now, the king had many times in his life then where he had a number of breaks. He is, he is worshiping the wrong God. He's doing his own thing. God sends him defeat after defeat. He should have been killed, but the king lets him go. And instead of turning to the living God, he still worships his little statue over in the corner somewhere. What a great tragedy. Some years later, the same king makes war against Israel. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, at such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And so the king of Israel, uh, uh, the, the prophet of Israel, supernaturally warns Israel where not to go. And so in chapter 6, verse 10, And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he, used, thus he used to warn him so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. So every time the king of Syria sets up a, an attack zone, the king of Israel is warned, don't go there, go around it. And he gets all these, this information from the prophet of God, which of course gets this information from the living God. In verse 11, the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, 
will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? He thought he had a leaker. And somebody was telling the king of Israel, he thought he had a traitor in the camp. But notice what his men say. They recognize the true and living God. Notice what they say. And the, one of his servants says, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. That should be a wake-up call, shouldn't it? But it isn't. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 13. And he said, Go and see where he is that I may send and seize him. Now, instead of repenting, instead of acknowledging the living God who is filling the prophet in on all his plans, that he actually knows what he's thinking, instead of acknowledging that that idol can't do anything, but the living God knows everything, instead of doing that, what's he want to do? He wants to kill the man of God. That's exactly what happens today. People want to silence the truth. They want to silence those who proclaim the truth. And so he's out to get Elisha even though there is clear evidence that the God of Elisha is the living God. Now notice all the times the king could have acknowledged then the living God. He might have gotten close in defeat, and he might have come to that point where ah, the God of Israel, he is the true and living God. He could have done that, but after he makes the treaty, his strength comes back. And see, that's what happens to people. They're in a bit of a tragic time in their life, and they, and they draw, they start drawing towards God, and then they become strong again. And when they become strong again, they are no longer drawing near to God. And he could have gotten close, but he didn't. Someone said it this way, just because you are not sick does not mean you're healthy. There are a lot of healthy, strong people walking around that do not realize that their lives are in great peril, that if they should die in their current condition, they will not go to heaven because they have not acknowledged the living God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And they, they look, you look at them, man, they look healthy. But they're not because they are lost in their sin. And many make plans for funerals. I was talking to a funeral director and he was talking to me about planning my funeral. Well, my funeral isn't planned yet, but my death is. See, making a plan for a funeral is wonderful, but what about for eternity? What, what about eternity? See, that's the real issue. And so they make plans for funerals, but they don't make plan for what happens after you die. Well, this is the king when all is well. What happens when his health begins to fail? Let's look at when all is not well. You know, illness, someone said, is the most heated of doctors. To goodness and wisdom, we only make promises. Pain, we obey. And, and you know, that's really true in my life. I rarely go to a doctor until it really hurts. Then I might find myself, I, my wife knows I'm in trouble if I say I'm going to go to see a doctor. And that's how much of us life is. And when we're feeling good, we often put off important issues, but when we're hurting, we begin to think about them. Second Kings chapter 8, verse 7, now Elisha came to Damascus. Ben-Had, ben ben the king of Syria, was sick. And when it was told him, the man of God had, and then it was told him, the man of God had come here. Now this is certainly the hand of God giving this king another opportunity. Why is Elisha in Syria. That's not a place where he's welcomed. It's a place where he's not welcomed. And so uh, the man of God is there. The king hears about it in verse 8. The king said to Hazael, take a present with you and go to meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord through him, saying, shall I recover from this sickness? Now, I want you to notice something. He calls the God of Israel the Lord. Something's changing here. I thought Rimon was the Lord. I thought that idol was his Lord. But now he's sick. And now he's desperate. And now he knows through experience that he is seeing the hand of God work over and over and over again. And now in the time of his crises, 
Instead of going to the temple of his false god, he goes to the prophet of the living God. It's a change of attitude. Sickness has a way of doing that. Elisha was once an outlaw to the king, and he was being sought out. But now the king's becoming humble because of his sickness. Elisha is not sent for, but rather sent to. And the king is remembering how Naaman has been, he had been healed in the past. He is remembering how many times he has seen the God of Israel move on behalf of his people. The king is coming in touch with reality. And here's the reality. Death is no respecter of persons. Did you know that? It's no respecter of power. Death will hit us all. A very famous preacher of the, of the 1500s, Henry Smith, was standing before British lords when he preached the message. And listen to what he said to them. And he didn't mince words. Mighty and gracious lords, I will tell you to what your honor shall come. First you shall wax old like others. Then you shall fall sick like others. Then you shall die like others. Then you shall be consumed like others. Then you shall be judged like others. Even like the beggars which cry at your gates. One sickens, the other sickens. One dies, the other dies. One rots, the other rots. Look in the grave and show me which was the wealthy man and which was Lazarus. It's a pretty sad scene when you think about it. Here's a millionaire, a billionaire. He has all. He has the best hospitalization plan out there. He doesn't have to worry about where his next meal's coming from. He's going to end up where? In the grave. Here's the poorest of poor. Where are they going to end up? In the grave. And you know what? In the grave, they're going to look alike. And so we are reminded of our humanity, but especially when we are sick, when we are hurting, when we are in need, that's when we are especially called to the fact that we will not be on this earth forever, and we're made aware of it. And people say, when you have your health, you have everything. But it's going to go. You know, I, I try and stay in shape. But I'm feeling a couple aches and pains. And if you're over 50 or 60, if you're not feeling some aches and pains, you're a pretty, pretty fortunate person. The reality is we begin to say, my body is not functioning the way it used to function. That should be a call to be aware that the day is coming that we will meet the living God. And sick beds are emotional scenes, aren't they? When you go to somebody on their sick bed, there's often a change of conviction, a change of thought. Things that were important yesterday are not important today. What's important today is, I am sick in bed, am I going to live or die? There's a change of emotions. Inhibitions go away too. You stop caring about what others think. You are now concerned with, what's my future like? And if we face death, as many do in this world, on a monthly basis, we would be a far holier people. You go to lands where Christians are persecuted, there is never a question in the life of those folks about worldliness, about what they'll do and what they won't do. They are sold out for Jesus. They know that their life is on the line all the time. They have committed to Christ. They will not turn back and they don't even think about the things of this world. Their lives are directed in service of the Lord. And they don't have time for the ease and sometimes the distractions that hit people who live in health and reasonable wealth. So, he is facing death. Notice what is said to Elisha in this process. Second Kings chapter 8, verse 9. So Hazael went to meet him, and took a present with him. Notice this, all kinds of goods at Damascus, 40 camel loads 
Now, is this guy serious about wanting to get healthy? See, when you're on the sickbed and you're told you're going to die, and you have a million dollars in the bank, and somebody says, I have a cure, but it costs a million dollars, what would you do? Would you empty your bank account if your wife would let you? I mean, what would a man give for his health? He sends 40 camel loads. He's, he, is, uh, he wants to kill Elisha before. Now he is loading him down with presents because he knows he has seen the power of God work through Elisha. And so he, he sends these 40 camel loads. And then it says, when he came and stood before him, he said, your son, Ben Hadad, Hadad king of Syria, has sent me to you. Your son... When did he become a son of Elisha? When did he become related to the God of Elisha? What do you mean, your son? Just earlier, he wanted to kill Elisha, but now he says, your son. Is there acknowledgement that the God that he's worshiping is nothing more than a statue and doesn't compare at all? Does he know in his heart? Do people know in their hearts when they get involved in ritual that is not the same as knowing the living God? Your son. That's a term of endearment. And so the king is understanding something. He is understanding. He has seen two things in life. He has seen the false gods and what they promised and the living God and what he does. And he's reflecting on the living God. And he says to the prophet, shall I recover from this sickness? Now there's something in sickness that breaks down the pride of mankind, said Charles Dickinson. Something in us that breaks us in sickness. And there is a deathbed conversion that sometimes takes place. Now, I wish I could say it always takes place, but I don't know. But often, people will pray on their deathbed to receive Christ. And when we go to the hospital and someone is dying, we want to talk to them about the gospel. We want to tell them about eternal life. I remember going once to a man and, and wanting to share Christ with them, I, I was told he would live two or three days. He said, I'm not interested. And I handed him a track, and I said, buddy, you're going to die, and you're going to heaven or hell. You don't want to hear what I want to say today, but I'm leaving you something so you have a chance to be forgiven of your sins and gain eternal life by confessing Christ as your Savior. Sometimes you have to be frank. The issues are that important. And so I handed him the track, never saw him again because he was gone very shortly thereafter. But when we go to the hospital, we want to share Christ with people. We want to make sure that they know that they know the Lord, because that is that important. And when someone's on the deathbed, often you get an ear that you don't get. But we need to be careful, and you need, you need to be careful. Lingering to the deathbed is a very risky game. St. Augustine said, there is one case of deathbed repentance recorded, that of the penitent thief that none should despair, and only one, that none should presume. The fear of death will cause a person to do many things, but they also make many promises. I've gone to visit the hospital, and people will say, Pastor, when I get well, I'll be in church. And so they get well, and I, hmm, maybe my eyes are failing me. And, and they don't keep their word. They, ta they, they play with the living God. And we need to be very, very careful about these kinds of things. And when somebody recovers, often you find that their word was not sincere at all. Don't wait until your deathbed to come to Christ. Don't put it off. And, and, and I want to tell you, let everybody know that you know the Lord. Let everybody know. It'll be a great encouragement at the funeral that everybody knows that you know the Lord. My wife's mother lived with us for seven years. She had Alzheimer's. And uh, it was an interesting seven years as she slipped away mentally over that process. But I remember when she first came, she would share that she wasn't sure. She'd been going to church. She believed in Jesus, but she just wasn't sure she was going to heaven. And, and I would sit down, and I would go over the scriptures with her. And finally, she came to that place where she, she, she could light up, and she said, I, I believe I believe, and see, the issue was not her. The issue was, do you believe in the credibility of God, who says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And, and that was the issue I kept getting. It's not an issue with you. Do you believe the living God who has given you his word? And so she finally came to that point. And once she passed away, I preached her funeral. It was in the old building, and we had standing room only. So many people in the church had come to know her in that seven years she lived with us. And, and, and so it was an, a wonderful time to share her journey where she became convinced that the gospel was true. And when she put her faith in Christ and she died, she would go to be with the Lord. And it was a wonderful time. A couple weeks, maybe a month later, my father showed up at my house, which was an unusual thing. And he said, uh, we, I came in and we were sitting at the dining room table. He said, Sal, I've been thinking a lot about the funeral that you preached for your mother-in-law. I wonder if you could preach a funeral like that for me when I die. I said, Dad, I would love to do that. I would love to preach a funeral like that. But you have never clearly made a statement to me that you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I don't know that, I can't preach with that same assurance. I, I, and I, I need that. And he said, son, as a little boy, I asked Jesus into my heart. I asked the Savior into my heart. And that has never changed. And I've made a number of errors, in life, but that has never changed. And I still believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I preached his funeral. I did it with joy. Because my father confirmed. Confirm your faith with your friends. Confirm your faith with your loved ones. Do not be ashamed of telling them that you have a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has saved you from the penalty of your sin. And because of that, you can spend eternity in heaven with him. Do not be ashamed to do that. And do it because they need that. Recently, I heard about a new movement called Honest Obituaries. And in it, people are writing honest statements about those who are deceased. I was going to print one and read it, and I, I just didn't have the heart to do it. Uh, one said, my father is being buried today. He was a rotten man. He wasn't sober. He left his wife. He left his children hanging. And they go through this whole thing. And, and, and I think it was on, on one of the news channels, world's worst obituary. But then another one said, my child died today at 24 years of old age on, as an overdose. And we begged with our child, and we begged them to get their life right. And they didn't. Man, I, I wonder what would happen if we saw some new honest obituaries. Now, it's not the pastor's job to say who's going to heaven and who's not. We, we don't know. God knows the heart, doesn't he? But it isn't, it, isn't it helpful when you go to a funeral and you know the person in the casket has surely lived for the Lord Jesus Christ and put their faith in Christ and there's no question about it? Isn't that a wonderful thing? And, you know, funerals, pastors try to tell the truth, but I tell you it's hard. Because you, don't, you, you know more. I remember a pastor that was preaching a funeral. And, and uh, he was waxing elegant about the person in the casket. And the wife leans over to her son, because her husband was in the casket. She said, son, go and see if that's pop in that casket. And we all know it. We know funerals are where we don't want to wound or hurt or say anything that but the reality is God knows if they know the Lord and it's helpful if you know and so that's a good thing Second Kings chapter 8 verse 10 Elisha said to him go say to him you shall certainly recover but the Lord has shown me that he shall certainly die so in natural causes he would recover but look what happens in verse 15 down the text a little further the next day as this uh, Hazael goes the next day he took the bedcloth and dipped it in water and spread it over his face, and the king dies. So he would have been okay, except for one thing. He didn't die of natural causes. He was murdered the next day, even though it was made to look natural because he was suffocated, and then I'm sure the cloth was removed. And you and I don't know. You say, well, I got out of the hospital bed. I feel really great. 
I'm going to live for me. How do you know? We don't know, do we? We don't know, and we can't know. But we can know that we know the Lord, and our confidence is in him. And so he dies, even after he received good news. He dies. And the question is, was he saved? And the answer is, I don't know. That's the great tragedy. That's the great tragedy when we say, I don't know. So make sure you let others know Jesus is your Savior. Now when a believer dies, it's a little different. The Bible says that you have been forgiven of your sins and you have been granted eternal life. And when a believer dies, the book of Psalms puts it this way, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord. That he knows they're being ushered into his presence. He has died for them and they have come to him and, and confessed their sins and, and declared that they need a savior and he has saved them and he has taken them to be with him. Now I want you to look at a moment at the death of a man of God, Elisha. It's now time for him to die. Things are a little different, though. He's not fearful of death. He's not clinging to whatever he can cling to. He knows he belongs to God. And in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14, now when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, what are we going to do without you, Elisha? Elisha is saying, I don't know what you're going to do without me, but I know where I'm going. I'm going to be with God. And so he's very confident in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 20. So Elisha died, and they buried him. Now the bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. Now I want you to notice this. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha and as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha he revived and stood on his feet wow what an event I mean the power of this man of God but I want to tell you you have the same power you have the power to bring people by telling them the truth from death to life. Your life can be lived in such a way that it impacts other people's lives, and at your funeral, they'll come from death to life, or having watched your life, they will come from death to life, because you will have displayed the power of God in your life, and they will see what it is to be a believer, and they will move from death to life. For God wants to use your life as an influence in a world that is dying and desperate. Now let me just close with this thought. Some people say, you know, I'm going to go to hell if I die without Jesus. Isn't it, are you trying to scare me into heaven? No, I, I want to wake up reality in your heart. The Bible says the wages of sin are death and, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in Revelation, we are judged based upon the works that we do, except, except if you have been pardoned, if you have received forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is not bad news, it is good news when you tell people that story. Here's the good news. If you went to a doctor's office and he did a test on you and you had cancer, but he didn't tell you that because he didn't want to hurt your feelings. You'll be okay. Take a couple pills and go home. What kind of doctor would that be? It'd be no friend of yours. Is telling a patient they have cancer hard? Sure. Not telling them is worse. And telling someone that they have a separation from God and they'll spend an eternity away from God, it's sometimes very hard. But if you don't tell them, how will they get the remedy? How will they know the good news? How will they receive forgiveness of sin? 
And the good news is that God is not interested in sending people away from him. He is interested in drawing people to him. That's why he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. And it is essential. So, sometimes it is hard. The question is, do we care enough about the eternal well-being of others to tell them the truth? And I trust we do. That is the power of sickness and of death. But death has no sting for those who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, help us to be bold and tell the truth. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And what does it mean to be saved? It means to be rescued from paying the penalty of our own sin and rather to receive the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of God. May everyone here today understand that and know that. And then may we go out with a wonderful desire to speak of a great Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and God bless you. Music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to 